Then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the most high power, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. All praises to Ahiah, Bahashim, Yeshaya, Rawawat, Kadash. It's all praises to the Father. In the name of the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is Sabal Nabaya. I have decided to start bringing some information on YouTube videos for edification purposes. This is the first one. I know that there are a lot of individuals bringing information on YouTube right now. Any videos that I bring will only be dealing with prophecy. During this first video, I wanted to expound on the subject of the 70 shepherds. Big Judah did an awesome video on the 70 shepherds. He and Elder Ayil from One Nation, One Power have been doing amazing work. And so if you guys haven't been checking out their channels, please check out their channels. Uh, I'll make sure to drop a link in the description to their different channels. Some of you might ask the question, why am I going to go into something that someone else has already covered? Well, I am going to cover what Big Judah covered in his video. But for any of you that have seen his video, that will be more of a review. Then, I'm going to go into some different information concerning that information that Big Judah did not go into. The Holy Spirit is revealing things at an alarming rate in my life and I can't keep it all in. I can't not share this information because it's too good. I'm not going to be the guy that buries what the Most High has given to me. So I hope you all will be here for this and I hope you all will be edified. Let's get into it. So Big Judah uses the book of Enoch that is within his sefer. I don't use the sefer. My book of Enoch is the R.H. Charles version. So that's the version that I'll be using and those are the verses that I'll give. So when it comes to interpreting prophecy, you get understanding the same way that you get understanding through anything else in the Bible. And that's through the understanding of Isaiah 28, 9 and 10. It reads, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Jump over to Psalms 119.104. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Drop down to verse 128. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. You cannot start to get truth and understanding and not start to hate every false way. It just goes hand in hand. So we're going to go to the book of Enoch, the 89th chapter, and we're going to read verse 54 through 77. And I may stop to interject comments along the way. And after that, I saw that when they forsook the house of the Most High and his tower, they fell away entirely, and their eyes were blinded. And I saw the Most High of the sheep, how he wrought much slaughter amongst them in their herds, until those sheep invited that slaughter and betrayed his place. And he gave them over into the hands of the lions and tigers and wolves and hyenas and into the hand of the foxes and to all the wild beasts. And those wild beasts began to tear in pieces those sheep. And I saw that he forsook that their house and their tower and gave them all into the hand of the lions to tear and devour them into the hand of all the wild beasts and I began to cry aloud with all my power and to appeal to the most high of the sheep and to represent to him in regard to the sheep that they were devoured by all the wild beasts but he remained unmoved though he saw it and rejoiced that they were devoured and swallowed and robbed and left them to be devoured in the hands of all the beasts. So I hope y'all took note of the way that these sheep 
forsook the Most High in his tower and fell away entirely. Then, that's when he began to bring the slaughter amongst them in the, in the way of the lions and tigers and wolves and hyenas and foxes. Okay, let's keep reading. And he called 70 shepherds, and we're going to talk about who those 70 shepherds are. But anyway, he called 70 shepherds and cast those sheep to them that they might pasture them. And he spake to the shepherds and their companions, Let each individual of you pasture the sheep henceforward, and everything that I command you, that do ye, and I will deliver them over unto you, duly numbered, and tell you which of them are to be destroyed, and them destroy ye. And he gave over unto them those sheep. And he called another and spake unto him, Observe and mark everything that the shepherds will do to those sheep, for they will destroy more of them than I have commanded them. And every excess and the destruction which will be wrought through the shepherds rec record, namely, how many they destroy according to my command, and how many according to their own caprice. Record against every individual shepherd all the destruction he effects. So, this is deep because these shepherds, you know, these shepherds were given instruction of how many sheep to destroy and how many to let live. But he's telling you that these sheep are going to do their own thing and there needs to be a record of it. Let's keep reading. And read out before me my number, how many they destroy, and how many they deliver over for destruction, that I may have this as a testimony against them. And I know every deed of the shepherds, that I may comprehend and see what they do, whether or not they abide by my command, which I have commanded them, but they shall not know it, and thou shalt not declare it to them, nor admonish them but only record against each individual all the destruction which the shepherds effect each in his time and lay it all before me. And I saw to those shepherds pastured in their season and they began to slay and destroy more than they were bidden and they delivered those sheep into the hands of the lions and the lions and tigers eat and devoured the greater part of those sheep and the wild boars eat along with them that's key we're going to talk about those wild boars later. And the wild boars eat along with them, and they burnt that tower and demolished that house. And I became exceedingly sorrowful over that tower, because that house of the sheep was demolished. And afterwards, I was unable to see if those sheep entered that house. And the shepherds and their associates delivered over those sheep to all the wild beasts to devour them and each one of them received in his time a definite number. It was written by the other in a book how many each of them destroyed of them, and each one slew and destroyed many, more than was prescribed. And I began to weep and lament on account of those sheep, and thus in the vision I saw that one who wrote how he wrote down every one that was destroyed by those shepherds day by day, and carried up and laid down and showed actually the whole of the book of the Most High of the sheep, even everything that they had done, and all that each one of them had made away with, and all that they had given over to destruction. And the book was read before the Most High of the sheep, and he took the book from his hand, and read it, and sealed it, and laid it down. And forthwith I saw how the shepherds pastured for twelve hours, and behold, three of those sheep turned back and came and entered and began to build up all that had fallen down of that house. But the wild boars tried to hinder them, but they were not able, and they began again to build as before, and they reared up that tower, and it was named the High Tower, and they began again to place a table before the tower, but all the bread on it was polluted and not pure, and as touching all this the eyes of those sheep were blinded so that they saw not and the eyes of their shepherds likewise and they delivered them in large numbers to their shepherds for destruction and they trampled the sheep with their feet and devoured them 
And the most high of the sheep remained unmoved till all the sheep were dispersed over the field and mingled with them the beast. And they, the shepherds, did not save them out of the hand of the beast. And this one who wrote the book carried it up and showed it and read it before the most high of the sheep and implored him on their account and besought him of their account as he showed him all the doings of the shepherds and gave testimony before him against all the shepherds and he took the actual book and laid it down beside him and departed. So that's the text right there. That is the text that we're coming from in the book of Enoch. Okay, so the Most High of the sheep said he was going to give them over to these wild beasts because they fell away from him and his tower. So let's get a precept for Enoch 89 and 55. Take a look at Jeremiah 15 verse 3. And I will appoint over them four kinds, saith the Most High, the sword to slay, and the dogs to tear, and the fowls of heaven, and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. So when we fall away from the Most High, we become sheep that are given to beasts for prey. Jeremiah chapter 12, let's start at verse 1, it says, Righteous art thou, O Most High, when I plead with thee, yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? Thou hast planted them, yea, they have taken root, they grow, yea, they bring forth fruit. Thou art near in their mouth, and far from their reins. But thou, O Most High, knowest me. Thou hast seen me, and tried mine heart toward thee. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter, and prepare them for the day of slaughter. Ezekiel 14.21 says, For thus saith the Most High Power, How much more? when I send my four sword judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword, and the famine, and the noisome beast, and the pestilence, to cut off from it man and beast. So part of the fulfillment of these prophecies actually um, was the cruelty that was set upon the new world by the explorers when they quote unquote discovered it. I'm going to read a little bit from American Holocaust. It's going to start right here at the bottom of page 86. It says, The Maya book of the Chilam Balam adds, What the white lords did when they came to our land. They taught fear and they withered the flowers so that their flower should live. They maimed and destroyed the flowers of others. Marauders by day, offenders by night, murderers of the world. Then the Spanish, joined now by other European adventurers and their military escorts, pushed on into South America. Notice how it says, the Spanish were now joined by other European adventurers. We're going to talk about that. Drop down a little bit more into the middle of page 87. It reads, Here, as the Caribbean, Mexico, and Central America one could fill volumes with reports of murderous European cruelties, reports derived from Europeans' own writings. As in those other locales, Indians were flogged, hanged, drowned, dismembered, and set upon by dogs of war, as the Spanish and others demanded more gold and silver than the natives were able to supply. Now I'm going to go to the bottom of page 88 where it reads, Hernando Pizarro would take the Indians in chains to carry what the conquistadors had pillaged. When the Indians grew exhausted, they cut off their heads without untying them from the chains, leaving the road full of dead bodies with the utmost cruelty. Entire towns and provinces were wiped out by these and similar practices. Those who did survive the Spanish gift for plague and famine and massacre and who were not force marched into jungles as the conquistadors enslaved beast of burden were subject to being herded together and driven from the highland residences in the Andes, 
to coca plantations on the sweltering peripheries of low-lying tropical rainforests. There, their lungs, long adapted to cool, thin air of mountain altitudes, were assaulted by a barrage of still more strange, debilitating, and murderous diseases, including Uda or Mal de los Andes, which ate away at the noses, mouths, and throats before bringing on a terrifyingly painful death. That actually reminds me of Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 12. It reads, A third part of thee shall die with the pestilence, and with famine shall they be consumed in the midst of thee, and a third part shall fall by the sword round about thee. And I will scatter a third part into all the winds, and I will draw out a sword after them. So it's actually very easy to see, using the precepts, how the prophecy of the 70 shepherds actually applies to northern and southern kingdom Israelites. Big Judah actually goes into even more detail than I did in explaining the atrocities and the horrors that were inflicted upon our people. But what I want to do is switch gears now and I'm going to focus a little bit on the 70 shepherds themselves. So the book of Enoch chapter 89 verse 59 says, And he called 70 shepherds and cast those sheep to them that they might pasture them. And he spake to the shepherds and their companions, Let each individual of you pasture sheep henceforward, and everything that I shall command you that do ye. And I will deliver them over unto you, duly numbered, and tell you which of them are to be destroyed, and them destroy ye. So, he says he's going to deliver them, duly numbered. So now let's go to the book of Genesis, chapter 11, and read verse 8. So, the Most High scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and left off to build the city. Of course, this is the chapter dealing with the Tower of Babel. It said that the Most High scattered them abroad. Okay. And it says upon the face of all the earth. Okay. Okay, so now let's go to the book of Jasher. Chapter 9, verse 32. It reads, And the Most High said to the seventy angels who stood foremost before him, to those who were near to him, saying, Come, let us descend and confuse their tongues, that one man shall not understand the language of his neighbor. And they did so unto them. And from that day following, they forgot each man his neighbor's tongue, and they could not understand to speak in one tongue. And when the builder took from the hands of his neighbor lime or stone, which he did not order, the builder would cast it away and throw it upon his neighbor that he would die. So what we're seeing here in this verse is that the Most High sent 70 angels to confuse the languages. And then we just saw in Genesis 11 that the languages were confused and then the people were scattered. Okay, so now let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 8 when the most high divided to the nations their inheritance when he separated the sons of Adam he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel stop this is translated that he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel but this happened before the children of Israel were born. So why is it translated that way? So let's take a look at the same verse in the Septuagint. So Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 8 in the Septuagint reads, When the Most High divided the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the nations according to the number of the angels of the Most High. 
Also, the Latin Vulgate Bible actually translates that verse as saying sons of God instead of angels or children of Israel. So now with that understanding, let's go back to the book of Enoch, chapter 89, verse 59. And he called 70 shepherds, 70 angels, and cast those sheep to them that they might pasture them. And he spake to the angels, the shepherds, the angels, and their companions, let each individual of you pasture the sheep, the people, henceforward, and everything that I shall command you, that do ye, and I will deliver them, deliver the sheep, over to you, duly numbered, because they were numbered where? They were numbered back in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8. Or to be more specific, they were really numbered in Genesis chapter 11. So, they were numbered at Babel. That's when the people were numbered. Let's see. Where were we reading? I lost my place. Over to you, duly numbered. And tell you which of them are to be destroyed, and them destroy ye. So, it's deep that these shepherds were actually supposed to only, they were actually supposed to, to, to guide over these sheep. They were supposed to actually shepherd. These angels were supposed to shepherd over these different nations. However, as you can see from reading the text in Enoch, they would begin to go into excess and destruction. You know, and this is probably due to them being worshipped as gods, because we we can see how all of the different um, how all the different nations serve all these different gods. You know, they pray to angels for different types of power, different types of fleshly things that they can accomplish here on earth, but it's not worth it. I also wanted to point out back in verse 58, um, where it says that the Most High was rejoicing. He was rejoicing because the, the wild beast began to tear in pieces those sheep. So then in 58 it says, But he remained unmoved, though he saw it, and rejoiced that they were devoured and swallowed and robbed, and left them to be devoured in the hands of all the beasts. Now that may sound harsh, that the Most High would rejoice at the devouring of the sheep. However, understand that these sheep, you know, had betrayed him. They fell away from him and his tower. Now I want to show you something in another book. This book is called The Conquest of Peru. No, I'm sorry. This book is called History of the Conquest of Peru by William H. Prescott. So we're going to go to page 160 of The Conquest of Peru. And this is dealing with uh, Francisco Pizarro and this encounter that he had with some natives. So it says that, um, well, I, I want to set this up for you so we don't have to read a whole lot of backstory. But basically, Pizarro was holding some of these natives and then he delivered these natives into the hands of their enemies. So let's read what happened when he did that. It is certain, however, that Pizarro was satisfied of the existence of a conspiracy, and without further hesitation, he abandoned his wretched prisoners, ten or twelve in number, to the tender mercies of their rivals of Tumbez, who instantly massacred them before his eyes. Maddened by this outrage, the people of Puna 
sprang to arms and threw themselves at once with fearful yells and the wildest menaces of despair on the Spanish camp. The odds of numbers were greatly in their favor, for they mustered several thousand warriors, but the more decisive odds of arms and discipline were on the side of their antagonists, and the Indians rushed forward in a confused mass to assault the Castilians, coolly received them on their long pikes, or swept them down by the volleys of their musketry. Their ill-protected bodies were easily cut to pieces by the sharp sword of the Spaniard, and Hernando Pizarro, putting himself at the head of the cavalry, charged boldly into the mist and scattered them far and wide over the field, until panic struck by the terrible array of steel-clad horsemen and the stunning reports and the flash of firearms and fugitives sought shelter in the depths of their forests. Yet, the victory was owing, in some degree at least, if we may credit the conquerors, to the interposition of heaven. For St. Michael and his legions were seen high in the air above the combatants, contending with the arch enemy of man, cheering on the Christians by their example. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So this book just said that the Spanish were fighting the natives and they looked up in the sky and saw the angels cheering them on. Now, the sad thing about this is that they probably had no idea how to identify the angels. The fact that it says St. Michael, you know, they don't know if they saw St. Michael or not, but I do believe that they may have seen angels. These angels were rejoicing. Well, that goes hand in hand with what we just read in the book of Enoch. It says that the Most High rejoices. So if the Most High is rejoicing, then most certainly his angels would be rejoicing. Heaven rejoicing. Why? Because these people, his people, who had fallen away from him, were now reaping what they had sown. Okay, so the final thing I wanted to talk about I wanted to talk about the Boers. So let's go back to the book of Enoch, chapter 89, and let's go to verse 66. And the lions and tigers eat and devoured the greater part of those sheep, and the wild boars eat along with them, and they burnt that tower and demolished that house. So notice that it says, and the wild boars eat along with them. Hmm. I wonder why it didn't distinguish the wild boars in the beginning with the lions and tigers and wolves and foxes and whatnot. But here it makes a distinction and the wild boars eat along with them. Well, let's get some precepts. So the book of Obadiah deals with the prophecy of Edom. It's only one chapter long. Let's go to verse, let's see. Let's go to verse 10, 11, and 12. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother, in the day that he became a stranger, 
neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. So wow, this tells you that Edom simply stood by, but then it says that he was as one of them. You know, that kind of sounds like what we just read in the book of Enoch about the wild boar. Because it made a point to say, and the wild boars eat along with them. One has to ask the question, why would Edom watch their brother be devoured? But you have to understand that Edom has a perpetual hatred. It says in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 35, verse 5, Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred, and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end. So understand that their hatred is what allowed them to look and do nothing. This isn't the first time that a brother has hated his own brother so much that he was complicit in the destruction of said brother. And of course what I'm referencing right now is when the brothers of Joseph sold him into slavery. What they did to him. Remember how the scriptures speak of how much they hated him because he was favored by Jacob. So it's funny how those things work. So getting back on the subject of Edom as the wild boar, I want to share something else with you. Another book. This book is called The Book of the Bibles. As for who the author is of this book, it says, edited by Andreas Fingernagel and Christian Gastegber. But it doesn't actually list an author. On the back of it, it says, Tashen, T-A-S-C-H-E-N. Um, so not sure if Tashton is the author um, but anyway this book of Bibles says the book of Bibles inside of this book I read something interesting and it comes with pictures the page I'm going to read out of this book is page 176 where it deals with the Herbaler Bible. I don't know if that's pronounced Herbaler or Herbalé. I'm going to say Herbaler. It says, The first complete Bibles in the German language only appeared in the 14th century, and until the invention of printing and the dawn of the Reformation remained a somewhat rare phenomenon. The Herbaler Bible belongs to a branch of these complete German language Bibles which traces its descent from some of the better translations. One indication of the quality of his translation, for example, is the fact that the word order adheres relatively closely to German syntax rather than to the Latin of the original. In a striking number of places, the Codex offers several possible translations or includes the original Latin word leaving it up to the reader to decide how to interpret the text. Matthias Erbeler, who commissioned the two-volume Vienna Codex, came from a wealthy Basel family. His grandfather converted from the Jewish to the Christian faith and obtained his Basel citizenship in 1393. So, wow. So, basically, the guy who commissioned this Bible 
Matthias Erbeler came from a Jewish family. A Jewish family. So, more than likely, this guy might have come from the seed of Amalek. That was my first thought. But then upon seeing the family crest, I'm going to show you now a picture of the family crest. Look at that. Red wild boars. You've got to ask yourself the question. If I am so-called Jewish and I know what the Bible says about a swine, the pig, a boar, why would I want to take that on as my family crest? But as you can see, the crest of Matthias Erbeler, this is what they used. And this was a Jewish family crest. So that is all I have for you. I hope that this information has been edifying. All praises to Ahaya Bahashem Yeshaya. Warawak. Shalawam. Enoch, a righteous man, whose eyes were opened by the Most High, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angel showed me. And from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw. But not for this generation, but for a remote one, which is for to come. Let me show you what Enoch wrote, insights into the past and the future he told. Angels of the Most High in heaven started looking around at us and seeing good looking women. And you know the thing about a little leaven that arrives in your heart and your sin begin to beckon. So the angels swore to sin together, mutual implication, they was bound together. So the angels chose wives from women, sins rose to fruition and the fallen went in them. They started teaching these witches how to witchcraft. And they was pregnant for a spell Then the witches gave birth to giants Unleashed all kinds of hell Men fed them all the food they could find Then they began to devour mankind Enoch was righteous He was a man of the Most High He had a testimony To his words draw nigh He walked with the Most High He was translated he did not see death because he pleased the Most High. Enoch was chosen to go and tell these fallen. Since ye have done as mankind and unto yourselves have taken wives, because ye have wrought great destruction, this is what you gotta deal with. You shall have no peace, no forgiveness, no repentance. And I know that you love your children. But you're gonna watch them die The destruction of your children The apples of your eyes And the murder of your loved ones You will see and you will lament And shall make supplication to eternity But you ain't getting no mercy or no peace Enoch was righteous He was a man of the Most High He had a testimony To his words draw nigh he walked with the Most High. He was translated. He did not see death because he pleased the Most High. Enoch was shown the foundations of the earth. He saw the secrets of the highest universe. He saw the treasuries of all the winds. He saw the pillars and the vaults of heaven. He saw the paths of the angels and the end of the earth. He saw the fires of hell and the throne of the first and so for the fallen mankind the fallen angels got dealt with and as for the women that they slept with they got turned into silence no myth and it was given unto Enoch the secrets of the time and it was shown unto him the lightnings and the signs Leviathan deep in the ocean behemoth in the waste wilderness Enoch saw the consummation and the judgment of life. 
But the most important thing is Enoch prophesies Christ The whole world needs to hear it Bless the name of the Lord of Spirits Enoch was righteous He was a man of the Most High He had a testimony To his word strong now He walked with the Most High He was translated He did not see death because he pleased the most high. Then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the most high power, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. 